Did you know that Virginia is the birthplace of American whiskey? Well, they've been making it there since 1607, and Catoctin Creek has been honoring that tradition of small craft rye whiskey since 2009. Virginia grain, Virginia water, and Virginia barrels. Catoctin Creek, the Virginia rye whiskey. This is brought to you by Smooth Ambler, a proud member of the Bourbon Pursuit family. Smooth Ambler builds on the traditional roots of American whiskey through innovative blends, proudly sourced whiskeys, and a unique line of their own homemade bourbon and rye recipes made in West Virginia. So venture off the traditional trail and go see them in Maxwellton, West Virginia. They'd love to welcome you to the family that they're building around their whiskey. Wilderness Trail is Sweet Mash Kentucky Straight Bourbon and Rye Whiskey, made by master distiller Shane Baker and fermentation expert Dr. Pat Heist. Whether it is high rye or weeded, cask strength or bottled and bond, Wilderness Trail is always non-chill filtered premium whiskey with unparalleled flavor. Distilled, aged, and bottled in Danville, Kentucky. Yeah, so that's, um, I don't even know what, what the question was. It got me down that rant, but. Is there any more bourbon hunting left? No. <laughs> hey everyone, it's episode 318 of Bourbon Pursuit the podcast featuring news, reviews, and interviews with people making the bourbon whiskey industry happen. I'm one of your hosts, Kenny Coleman, and before we start today's episode, talking about dusty bourbon, here's your weekly bourbon news update. The legendary Stitzelweller Distillery begins a new chapter in its 86-year history with the opening of the Garden and Gun Club. This destination cocktail bar is inspired by Garden and Club Magazine's hospitality franchise, and it will be located on the second floor of the Stitzelweller Distillery. It'll be offering unique food and drink experiences along the Kentucky Bourbon Trail. The space offers a curated drink list, including a Blade & Bow 22-year-old tasting experience and a unique bar menu that is a modern-day take on classic Southern favorites developed by executive chef Ann Kim and will have a capacity for around 60 people. Wild Turkey has announced the launch of its new global creative campaign and platform called Trust Your Spirit, and it features the brand's creative director, Matthew McConaughey. This also includes a brand new roll-up design of Wild Turkey 101. Now moving on to bourbon release news. Wild Turkey has announced Masters Keep 1. This is a project where Jimmy and Eddie Russell both had a hand in as Eddie now celebrates his 40th year at Wild Turkey. It combines Jimmy's love for 8-10 to year old bourbon with Eddie's passion for older whiskeys around the 14 year mark. Both of these were mingled together and went into a second barrel aging process using new toasted and charred barrels. This rested also in Tyrone G Warehouse. This will have a retail price of around $175. Well, the toasted barrel train continues because eighth generation beam distiller Freddy No is launching a new expression called Basil Hayden Toast. The difference is that this consists of an entirely new brown rice forward mash bill and a toasted barrel finish. This is bottled at the standard 80 proof for Basil Hayden and has a price tag of $50. Heaven Hill Distillery has announced the eighth release of Old Fitzgerald Bottled and Bond with the fall release of the 2021 that will be 11 years old. And these come in those really nice fancy decanters. The barrels used in this release were filled in the spring of 2010 and rested in Warehouse EE. These will be bottled at 100 proof and has a retail price of $110. Barrel Craft Spirits has released Barrel Bourbon Batch 30. This is a blend of straight bourbon whiskeys that are 5, 6, 9, 10, 11, and 15 years old that are coming from Tennessee, Kentucky, Indiana, and Wyoming. The 5-year-old barrels are from Indiana, and then the Tennessee barrels are 6, 9, 10, 11, and 15 years old. Finally, a weeded bourbon from both Kentucky and Wyoming were added to the blend. This is bottled at cash strength, which is 117.32 proof, and has a suggested retail price of $90. Old Forester is releasing its newest expression of the 117 series. This is the label that adorns Jackie Zykan's signature, and it will be called Warehouse K. This limited edition release is sold in 375 ml bottles and pays homage to Old Forester's home place located on Whiskey Row. Warehouse K has gained almost a cult-like following for featuring a blend of barrels aged on different floors. Constructed back in 1953, Warehouse K uses heat cycling and has long been one of Old Forester's favorite places for single barrel expressions. 
Warehouse K will be exclusively available at Old Forester Distilling Company and at select Kentucky retailers at a suggested retail price of $50. So what is a dusty bourbon? Well, really, it's just old bourbon. The idea is that these were bottles that used to sit on the shelves and collect dust. Nowadays, we consider them rare gems and lots of bourbon hunters go crazy looking for them. Unfortunately, the days of finding a 1980s old grand on the shelf are pretty much long gone. But we sit down and analyze what makes a dusty bourbon a dusty. There's lots of factors to consider on why a bourbon has changed so much in recent decades and we give our takes on what some of those key factors might be. Barrel Bourbon is known for their expertise in crafting unique blends, taking lots of different whiskeys from different regions and bottling it at cash strength. And you can even buy them online. Just visit BarrelBourbon.com and click the Buy Now button. With that, enjoy today's episode. And now here's Fred Minnick with Above the Char. I'm Fred Minnick, and this is Above the Char. This week's idea comes from longtime listener and our good friend, Alan Channel or you could pronounce it Chanel, but I'm pretty sure it's Channel. Alan, if I got that wrong, blame uh, blame Kenny. Uh, <laughs> but he, Alan writes me on fredminnick.com. That's fredminnick.com. And he has a couple of questions. I'm going to go ahead and choose uh, one I think is really good and we can all learn from. And that is when a distiller makes a variety of whiskey, be it bourbon, rye, weeded bourbon, wheat whiskey, whatever. Do they tend to use the same yeast strain, or is there no correlation? Well, first of all, let's put these distillers in groups. You have your craft distillers, which, I mean, I'll be honest with you, craft distillers do some wild, wild west stuff, and they'll, they'll break up yeast like nobody's business. So they will indeed like use different strains of yeast and different types and all that, and they'll do all kinds of experimentation because they're just finding their footing. However, the larger distillers use typically one yeast outside of like Four Roses, which has several yeast strains. And that was basically because of a a Seagram's protocol that always had 10 recipes going into a batch. And every time that they had a distillery close and they lost that recipe style, they essentially created a different yeast strain to compensate for uh, the loss of a distillery. So Beam, Heaven Hill, same yeast. And it's basically the same yeast uh, uh, across the board with these things. Now, I, will, I do know that yeast reacts very differently with, with grains. And so when someone has a yeast that they perfected and created specifically for a rye whiskey, it doesn't always taste the same. It doesn't always have that same kind of powerful effect as it does with the bourbon. A really good example is MGP, which is using the the V yeast. That V yeast is the same V yeast that uh, Four Roses has, and it's basically it, it was created to deal with like rye, rye mash bills, and and high rye content. And so when you when you use that V yeast in some of their weeded recipes, it can taste kind of kind of funky. But, you know, sometimes that's a good funk. I do like me some funk from time to time. But uh, I hope that answers your question, Alan. And if I butchered your name, uh, let me know. I want to make sure I, was, I, I pronounce it right next time. But uh, I appreciate you writing, Alan. If you want to be like Alan and have a chance of me butchering your name on air, hit me up on fredminnick.com. That's fredminnick.com. Click that contact button, and I'll be happy to read your question if it makes the cut. That's going to do it for this week, folks. Be safe out there. Cheers. Welcome back, everybody, to this very special edition of Bourbon Pursuit, where if you're watching on camera, you might be looking at some of the bottles we have lined up here going, what, what are these old old bottles? And this is, a, this is actually a very fun it's episode. It's a rare I'm, opportunity. It is a it's very this, rare opportunity. It's right here on the tag. <laughs> because today, we're going to be talking about Dusty's. This is something that I've been wanting to talk about for quite a long time, not only because it's hard to understand. We, we thought it like, oh, can we get like some size scientist on here to talk about what is what's the chemical makeup? And it's like, I don't really think a lot of scientists are like getting funded to go and figure this sort of stuff out. But it is fun to sit here and think about theories and think about <laughs> what the stilling techniques were and how things are different, because there's no doubt about it. When you're tasting old whiskey, 
it definitely does taste different. Mm -hmm. And it's just fun to just drink it <laughs> and talk. We don't even have to get into the details. We can just hang out and drink it. That's I'll, yeah. I mean, that's I mean, really, that's what we signed up here for, folks. So if you're just you know at home listening or in the car listening, just know you're. Your three dudes are about are having some great whiskey here. We should actually say we got the Old Crow uh, Traveler Fifth. You know, this when this came out, you know, vodka was on the rise, and this was thought to be, you know, something that would be a little bit of an answer to the martini crowd because they would go around with their little uh, their martini kits, go out on the on the lawn, put their blanket out, and they listen to the Beatles or whoever. And um, and make their martinis. This was thought to be a little bit of a uh, a pushback on that. And then we have this uh, old uh, Heaven Hill here, a ten year, uh, and we actually have it. Um, this is uh, distilled in 1962, bottled in 1973, and it is a. And, and you might hear that say like, "Oh, that's not ten years old." Uh, it's actually, you know, to the that was it was distilled in the fall of uh, sixty two, a bottle in the spring of seventy two. So, it is ten years old by law. And is uh, the bottled and bond that we have here today? Exactly, too. it's, it's a, the it's, bottled and bond, which, yep. which you. Uh, I'm very glad to get that bottle. Yeah, well, uh, we might Bernie, be Bernie be proud. <laughs> we might be killing it on open over here, and then then we got the uh, one of the first uh, rare breeds uh, that came out, and so rare breed was basically you know, in the wave of like bookers and all these other kind of like original small batches and notorious as they are, the cork broke off on a skinny as I tried to open it with my skilled like little side technique. Didn't work. Pushed it right on in. There, there's no technique that can uh, get a cork out of a turkey, Dusty, <laughs> successfully. It is, it is really hard. I've I mean, never seen it happen. I've never seen anybody successfully take one. Those out. corks. They those, always break. They yeah. always, they, those corks just get all mushy. You know, or they're all dry. And so, like, something to do with the bottling, and the proof, and the quality of the cork they used back then. But the damn things always break. Yep. Ryan, what's the what's the proof on that one? By the way, before people kind of know what we're what we're. I'm going to guess. This. I'm going to go mm, one twelve and some change. I'm trying to find it. Mm. Uh, oh, here we are. Well, ironically, it's 108.4 proof. Ah! Oh, close. They know that that's a good proof. They know what they're doing. <laughs> Somebody <laughs> else proves that. They get a 108 barrel strength over there. That's right. It does taste hotter than 108 proof, though. I'm going to tell you right now. Yeah. It tastes pretty hot to me. So I kind of want to get in uh, a little bit to you all, like the allure of Dusty's and what makes them so grand. And for anybody that it, I'll tell my story as I start coming to this too. And when I started really getting to bourbon, I know that when I started going on, you know, the different secondary markets and you see what's out there and all of a sudden people are selling like old bottles that have, you know, from national distillers, old granddad, and they literally have price tags on them for $7 and 99 cents, but people are selling them. And this is, let's rewind the clocks back to like 2014, 2015 timeframe. And they're selling them for like $199. And I'm like, who the Fuck would mm -hmm. ever pay $199 for something that used to sit on the shelves for eight dollars back in the day. Yeah. Like blew my mind, never thought about it. I'm like, I'm I'm all in with the new, never gonna do it. And it took it actually probably took a, a solid probably one to two years after that for somebody to actually give me my first dusty pour. I think it was probably at Whiskey Pig or the down that oh, was yeah, Whiskey Pig was your first dusty that was, it wasn't my it wasn't my first one, but it was definitely one of the earlier days. Yeah. I mean, well, I, I had had dusty bourbons, but I hadn't that was the first time like you had like the really good ones and you know, you had Bill Thomas there and everybody telling you about them and and you know, at the time, you know, you you say it was two hundred dollars, but to me I was like and that was a steal nowadays, but you know, it, and it, this was right when bourbon was starting to really get popular and camping was beginning, you know, limited releases were getting harder to get and you're paying exorbitant amounts for antique and pappies and all this. So like, to me, I was, Dusty's were kind of like a value opportunity back then. It was like, all right, I can get some that's really good and unique for under a couple hundred bucks. And You'd it's be under sub a hundred. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I remember when I first bought old granddads, I was getting them for like 75 bucks, you know, for, you know, mid eighties, low eighties, old granddads. And they were just, worth every penny i mean they were butterscotch bombs that it tastes just like werther's i mean they're just so pleasant but uh well i think anybody who gets into dusty hunting cannot uh cannot think about can't think about it without remembering seeing the things that are on that you could see on the shelves when you were turning of legal drinking age and you would walk right past it 
I remember seeing the the veined uh, uh, oh, wellers, oh, yes. the veined wellers. They would they were for some reason very. They were still on the shelves in Oklahoma in the late nineties and stuff like that. And, and, you know, I just buy a uh, Jim beam and, and it's like that stuff I could have bought. I mean, I actually would have had 40 bucks or something where I could have afforded to buy that sort of thing. And I just, you know, you look back to that time, you're like, I wish I had a time machine. <laughs> we all wish we had time you know, machine. I yeah. wish I had a time machine. Where's the DeLorean? Okay, I mean, like my dad, he, I tell this story all the time. He worked for bourbon companies doing like machinery, like, gear and tool and dye repair and they were given bottles special releases this is like christmas gifts and i can't tell me elijah craig like 21s 19s you know noah's mills row age dated rowan creeks from back in the day that Ooh. you know we would drink i would just take to like college parties and stuff and i'm like god i was such an asshole you know <laughs> i'm taking these to the parties and like mix them with coke and stuff you know it's so, so stupid but you didn't know i mean yeah. i don't think anybody knew I got into it. Well, some people knew. Let's put it that way. I got into it almost immediately uh, when I got into bourbon, like, you know, professionally. Was there somebody that kind of like gave you that? that yeah, J- Jason Bronner. Jason At, Bronner, Bourbon's, Bourbon's Bistro. Bistro. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I would spend a lot of time at Bourbon's Bistro. And I have to tell you, like, I don't think that man ever gets enough credit for what he has done for bourbon, uh, being the first like bourbon themed restaurant in Kentucky. And, you know, I just, I just think the world of Jason and, uh, he would have all of these like, uh, decanters, you know, he'd get these beam decanters. He would get all these old Fitzgeralds and he would get everything. A man would never charge you. You were just sitting there and you would just be drinking with him, talking, you know, Veach would come along sometimes and we would just be sitting there at Bourbon's Bistro or out on his patio be drinking freaking (laughs) 1950s uh kentucky tavern and like talking about uh how good it was in sports and it was just i look back on that time of my career and i just i miss it so much i miss it so much but that was that was where i cut my teeth on, on on dusties and it would be it would lead me to meeting random people in parking lots and literally handing over bags es- of cash. Estate sales. You know, <laughs> showing up to every yard sale in the in the county. It's like, just, we got any bourbon in there? <laughs> <laughs> it could take you down a very weird path. I just I just miss those times. Yeah, those are the early dusty. I mean, yeah, we've been there with Jason, you know, up in his his uh, office where all the decanters are. I mean, he he's such a great host and knows all the history and everything yeah. about each one and so like you get he gets one to canter down and you talk about it for like 30 or 40 minutes and then you move on to the next one it's a it's a great time but yeah i mean i, I would say bill thomas was probably for us for me anyways was kind of he was your sherpa yeah. he was kind of our my sherpa you know in the dusty bourbons and we're talking know. about two great sherpas here oh bourbon, gosh you know? i mean yeah bill just gets so excited mm-hmm. and animated you know when he's talking about it and uh i, I had the lucky opportunity to stay at his house and you know, drink some of the green glass Van Winkle rise, you know, and from Lawrenceburg and stuff. And man, that was like the best, probably the best whiskey I've ever had in my life. And, uh, you know, some people just like old stuff because and right. they just don't like the present, you know, but there is something magical about drinking history, you know, thinking about what was going on in that time, you know, what was going on in the world. And it's just a fascinating thing and something unique you get to experience every time you do. Well, and it's also very important for us to talk about the differences and how they were made. Now, a lot of these plate, a lot of these brands will have the same recipe, but we are looking at, depending on the generation of the time, you're looking at like different water was being used, right? So, and different techniques for the water, you know, so at the very basis of the core of like all the, all the parts of what whiskey is, it was all very different. The corn, if it was pre, if it was pre nineteen fifties, it was it was it was non hybrid corn. Starting into like the nineteen fifties, a little bit in the forties, you know, after we had so many people starving with the you know, with the Great Depression and everything in the Dust Bowl, uh, scientists started working on like hybrid corn, which would basically allow the uh, allow farmers to have something that was a little bit more drought resistant. And then so they were breeding corn in labs. You know, that would later turn into genetically modified corn. And, you know, so if we're tasting something pre-1955, uh, really pre-1970, the chances are you were you were tasting a whiskey that the farmer had actually planted the seeds and had developed the corn strain in his own or her own farm. 
And that right there, you know, th those are two things, you know, the water and the corn being differently. Uh, but the most important factor, in my opinion, is the distillation technique. It's the fermentation technique. It's the yeast. And of course, the wood. Most of the wood used for the barrels that you we just basically named off the entire <laughs> yeah. process. You're like basically the most same. important thing is everything. <laughs> well, okay. well, <laughs> well, I was going to go. I was going to say wood, but then I was like, oh, well, what about the yeast? Well, no, yeah, this one's important. Too. Basically, uh, if you take all of those things, you know, of all of those things being the most important, the wood we're looking at first growth wood. You know, the the wood that's you being used right now for uh, for barrels, they're being you know, plucked on private land, you know, they're between 60 and 90 years old. The The trees that people were cutting down back then, there's a good chance, man, that, that a human hadn't seen that tree in, uh, in the 1940s to 1970s until someone hit it with a chainsaw or, or a blade, you know? So you're looking at like the, the very best of oak, uh, different techniques on, on making whiskey. And also there were no computers. There were no, um, there was not automation. It was humans doing everything. And then you had some people like Pappy Van Winkle who actually resented uh, the growth of chemists in the industry to the point where he put up signs like no chemists allowed. So there was a lot more uh, attention to human detail than to computer efficiency. You know, so we have seen a lot of changes over the years. Uh, in terms of like what goes into the bottle. The recipes may be the same. They like to say that at Wild Turkey, and that is true. But there's also been some legal changes that have allowed whiskey to be different. In 1962, they increased the barrel entry proof from 110 from uh, the legal maximum to 125. By increasing it to 125, they could get more volume and basically put out more bottles, thus make more money. It also reduced uh, their tax they're basically their tax liability. But there's only a handful of bourbons today that if you were to say like, okay, we're going back to the laws of 1958, it's only a handful of bourbons that would be considered bourbon today. Four Roses, Wild Turkey, everything at Buffalo Trace would not be considered bourbon because none of them are going into the barrel at 110. Baker's Mark, on the other hand, and, a, and you know things like uh, Wilderness Trail, uh, you know, those would be definitely be considered, you know, bourbon because they're going at 110. So there's a lot of production factors that make this whiskey to me always that much more special. And, and also it is incredibly, incredibly inconsistent. And as I point to the tops here, uh, and that one over there, the enclosures that they used dictate the flavor that we get today. Sometimes that you get a you get a dusty that tastes spot on and it's exactly like it should be. Or sometimes you get one like I like I had recently with a 1945 Kentucky Tavern. And um, I mean it tasted like sweat, leather, and uh and gross. And it's because <laughs> yeah, the, like a gym, if you will. Like it was just like a gym. And the inside of the cap, you know, if you take a look underneath here, so Sometimes you see there's like, there's some little plasticky kind of like there's an adhesive there. Mm -hmm. You know, if it's not stored properly, that adhesive gets into the whiskey and you don't want that. It does not taste good. All of those miniature bottles, uh, I used to collect the miniature bottles and um, you crack those things open, no matter what the whiskey is, it's it's going to have, it's going to be contaminated from the cap and it, it typically. And so you you really do not always get a great experience with the Dusties, but when you do, it's magical. magical. Yeah. It's magical. So we heard Fred's sort of uh, take on it. It takes everything. Ryan, do you think, mm -hmm. is there is there one thing that we look at in regards to Dusty's? I mean, there's wood, there's corn, there's the water. Like, is there something in your mind that sticks out that is something that might be a little bit more, I guess, forgiving or, or maybe more influential to that process? I think it's oxygen has, I, I, I don't know this exact percentage, but you got to think that oxidizing is playing a huge role in these, you know, as we've seen, this cork was not meant to age, you know, the bottles, the seals and stuff. So oxygen's getting in there and changing the liquid stuff's evaporating, stuff's moving around, you know, and I, I think that I've had it happen with, you know, newer bottles that I've. You got to remember, a lot of people used to call this stuff rot gut. Right. Back in the day, they'd be like seventies, yeah. eighties. Like, I'm not drinking. This is rot guts. Oh, yeah. we're, we're like, oh, give us more. Well, I think it's brand <laughs> dependent on that, but uh, 
you know, oxidation, man, they, it, absolutely. It, it's, it's all about the fit of the cork or, or whatever. And if you see it, you know, significantly below the neck, stay the heck away from that. Don't buy it, right? Yeah. Um, and then a lot of that is like, you know, when I was amassing a library, I would always, the questions I would ask would be about storage. And one time I found out a lady like was storing her stuff next to the kitty litter, like her, her cats. I was like, I am not buying anything that's been stored next to kitty litter. Yeah. I, I, and too, like if you ever leave like, you know, a, leave a glass full of bourbon, you know, out and you go taste it the next day, it doesn't taste as hot or, you know, the alcohols, you know, it's mellowed out drastically. You don't put it straight yeah. in the dishwasher? <laughs> I, I've always just tried it just to see what it tastes. <laughs> you're I mean, a, I, you're a little science experiment. I brush my teeth with it. I mean, it's, you know, <laughs> not wrong. all the time, but I'm like, well, what does this taste like, you know, after it's set out all night? And it definitely loses. So, because a lot of these older whiskeys were younger, now well, some were older, but I think too, the oxygen kind of calms that, you know, the, the hot aspect or the graininess of it or corn. That's just a theory. But, uh, you know, that just from me observing, me leaving my bourbon glass out after a long night. It is true. I mean, when you, I think the only bottle up here that's probably on the the opposite side of that is this Old Heaven Hill. That's a, a ten year, but a lot of times the the dusty ish era, it was four to six year old whiskey. Like that was a, a pretty normal thing back then. And now I think we're kind of like seeing a little bit more of the rise of that because we do see a lot more whiskey coming out at a much younger age. But you do see a lot of stuff that was, you know, whether it was, um, uh, you know, bourbon deluxe. And a lot of things that were coming out of National Distillers at the time, they well, were a granddad lot. was, yeah. you know, forward, forward. By to the six way, years Bourbon years. Deluxe, if you're, that's a great value, Dusty, that you can get and people don't respect it. That's a good one. I respect. If you have any, call me. Call us. <laughs> you know. I mean, it's, I know we're in the middle of the interview and I know no, you no, want to get down this. No, no, this no, old crow going. is so amazing. It's, it's fantastic. This like, old crow is like, it's like butter on my palate. And, and, so, and every time I have Dusty's, like, we all have our favorites and, you know, Usually, whatever you're drinking at the time is your favorite, but I go back and forth between the Dusty Turkeys and National Distiller, and when I drink this Old Crow, I'm like, gosh, National Distiller, you were, I'm just so sad you're not here anymore. I know. <laughs> and, and it like, it's and, like and everything I have from there has been just- They've been, <laughs> they were amazing. Yeah. And, I mean, if this came out today, this would be the best whiskey on the, on the shelf. Oh, I mean, hands down. I mean, it says right on the back, it says four fifth quart, and this whiskey is four years old. Yep. Right there on there. From the Old Crow Distillery, Frankfort, Kentucky, I mean, Louisville, Kentucky. Got... 90 proof. I mean, look at that color, though. It doesn't look like a four-year-old. That's an amazing color. So here's the other thing that people also talk about with Dusty's, and maybe it, it, it could be true, was maybe it was during the glut era. And knowing that you weren't going to go and change a bunch of labels and do all this, you had all these older stocks. And so people were putting older stocks of whiskey that could have been 8, 10, 12, 15 years old into a four-year-old bottle and it didn't really matter because back at the time nobody cared about high age dating. yeah i mean that's uh that's uh, the the standard for for old whiskey back then was eight years old if something was north of eight years old they would look at it you know the consumers would not look at it um uh, you know positively and i think you know an interview with bernie lovers he talked about his old man talking about that and you can watch movies like the hustler and they reference eight-year-old bourbon and you didn't really see the you didn't see a, a the the glut effect in terms of like that sort of thing until you got into the seventies. But you you would not see many barrels uh, north of ten years old in this time. Now during Prohibition, you would see a lot of like seventeen. You know, yeah, because we've seen the tailors. You know, yeah, that are like seventeen, eighteen. That that they were just put putting them out there. They were just putting anything out during Prohibition or right before Prohibition when they knew. They're like, well, shit, we're not going to get any money during Prohibition. Let's mm -hmm. sell it now. You know, so it was such a different time. And uh, the area, it's funny, like, I don't know if you plan to go there, Kenny, but what the area that I tell people to really stay away from, unless they're a serious collector, is the Prohibition medicinal area. Because one, there's a lot of fakes that got out during that time. And two, they just did not care about the quality of the whiskey. It was just to get it out so people could have some medicinal whiskey and it was just not the same level. Yeah, not I feel so, like it's too risky. <laughs> it, it is a really risky time period, especially if you want to if you want to drink it. I've had a lot of stuff from like the 1800s. You know, I've had stuff from from pretty much every period and I get brought in by auction houses to 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 validate bottles and you know, to give stories on them and you know, they're the the thing about those eras is that they're not modern fakes, 
like bootleggers of the time were faking the stuff. <laughs> right. And Back they were the and they weren't faking it with like, oh, by the way, we're faking it with a nice touch of Stitzelweller and a little bit of wild turkey. No, I mean they're putting like in our, in our own PVC capsule. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> with our own heat gun. We're just they, they, they're doing it with kerosene. So and then there were times that too they would bottle piss. You know, so there would be like there would be like fake bottles in there. You know, so you people always want the old days come out. I'm like, no, <laughs> the yeah. stories like that. I'm like, we're doing just fine right now. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, that era, that era is risky. But like, if you know, like there was somebody who found a bunch of bottles in their house and it made it all over the news recently. And I looked up who lived there and I looked up what brand it was. And it was the most like counterfeited brand in Canada of the time and it was a it was a scotch i can't remember the name of the scotch and it happened to be um and the guy happened to be like in northern new york so you know he's obviously got a, a pipeline into canada i was like i was like i would not touch those bottles with a 10-foot pole this is a known this is a known like counterfeiter at the time a bootlegger and and this is the most bootleg brand uh of that time and uh yeah so you got to be careful when you're when you're going prior to the regulatory years of whiskey. So on that note, let's kind of talk about dusty hunting or the uh, the days that used to be dusty hunting. Because I know that, I mean, even when I got into it back in you know 2014 timeframe, there was an opportunity, but even then, even in Kentucky, there were people way ahead of me, you know, Larry Rice's Silver Dollar, the Justins, like you name it, that had already cleared the shelves out of Kentucky. You didn't really stand yeah. a chance. And I didn't have the hindsight or should I say foresight at the time when I was doing a lot of travel, uh, either domestically, internationally, to actually go and, and search for this stuff. Would have been a perfect opportunity to do it. But I mean, is it, is it fair to say that pretty much every store, every shelf has been cleaned in the United States at this point? Spirits of French Lick exploded onto the distilling scene early in 2016 as Indiana's largest double pot still distillery. They employ old world sentiment with new world attitudes, delivering the finest handcrafted bottle and bond bourbons to an audience eager for an alternative to the big guys. And their distiller, Alan Bishop, uses historic Hoosier yeast strains, alternative grains, and 53 gallon number two char barrels to bring you spirits with unparalleled quality and depth of flavor. You can find all spirits of French Licks products and new releases on sealbox.com. But don't just take Fred Minnick's word for it. Find out for yourself. Check out spiritsoffrenchlick.com and follow them on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. And remember, always drink responsibly. Total Wine & More is ready for summer. They've got all your pours for the great outdoors, like their top 12 wines under $15. And raise a glass to America with a star-spangled selections of sips made in the USA and beat the heat with refreshing bourbon cocktails. Why not mix it up and serve a brown derby or a peachy keen at your next barbecue? Then taste your way to a new flavorant, like ready-to-freeze cocktail pops and fun, fizzy, hard seltzers. Lime, pineapple, and peach, anyone? So no matter if you're grilling, chilling, or both, you're sure to find cool prices on over 8,000 wines, 4,000 spirits, and 2,500 beers. In-store or TotalWine.com. Heaven Hill Distillery just launched a 3D behind-the-scenes tour of their Bernheim Distillery, the largest independent family-owned bourbon distillery in the world. See for yourself how they produce 1,553 gallon barrels of new make whiskey per day before it makes its way to the barrel for aging. From grain trucks to copper stills, drop into this 3D experience at heavenhilldistillery.com and navigate your way around the distillery for a step-by-step -step look at how they crafted their award-winning lineup of American whiskeys. Heaven Hill reminds you, think wisely, drink wisely. Cheers. Is it fair to say that pretty much every store, every shelf has been cleaned in the United States at this point? Like it, is no, it, it has I to be? I, no, I don't think so. I think that every, I, I mean, and you all do too, I get, I get probably 10 emails a week of someone uh, inheriting their families, whatever. And there'll be a case down there. Well, I didn't even know grandma drank and she's got six bottles of old Fitzgerald, you know, from 1955. Are those worth anything? Why? 
Oh, so, well, that's that's one thing. Yeah, that, that's I, talking about in liquor stores. I'm talking about like you going, going like you driving around in middle of Kansas and you're like, oh, oh, I don't consider those dusties. Well, I mean, that's these were all found on the shelf at some point, you know, yeah. and okay. and so if if you're looking, I mean, we'll we'll say like Larry Rice would tell the story of yeah, going into a liquor store and be like, got anything that's hand sold in the back, and yeah. there'd be like case upon case of Granddad or something, you know, from back in the from the National Distillery. Yeah, time. yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. I I, I guess I, we should also clarify what. What we consider dusties versus what other people consider dusties, what yeah. you consider dusties. Yeah, yeah. That, that's a good. That, I think that uh, you know anything, anything like nineteen pre nineteen ninety five, you know is 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 like would be a dusty, and then after that, you have kind of like a contemporary dusty period from ninety six to two thousand five, and then after that, it's like it's if it's within fifteen years, I. I don't consider that a dusty. Mm -hmm. In, yeah, I'm probably the same. I'm probably, I might go 99 and before, but yeah, anything, at least before 2000, I think is considered dusty for me. I'd say 2000 is a pretty good year. Yeah. yeah. I mean, because usually when, when somebody says the word pre-fire, you're like, oh, 96. Like, you're, yeah. you know exactly when that is. Yeah. Yeah. So I think, I think that's probably a good qualifier. That, that's, that would fit within the range. But, you know, there are some... You know, there's also the regulatory years, like you have like uh, everything that's on a, like a stamp is, all of this is regulated, right? But there was a time when the bottle and the whiskey and all that was not regulated. And so you wouldn't see proofs on there. You wouldn't, and so like until the Pure Food and Drug Act, you wouldn't see much information on the label at all. You know, so I think it, it, it just... It, the bottle is a story in itself and an evolution, and that's how you're able to identify. Why did they stop with like the tax stamps? Because I I really enjoy them because it gives you like a Actually, clear you know a clear bottle. day to mm -hmm. yeah you don't have to yeah. So out. that was under the Reagan administration when President Reagan took office. He began a a slew of deregulation, and Reagan believed that the alcohol industry needed to be deregulated at the same time as the utility industry and the airline industry and a couple others. And all the all those industries were like, yes, deregulate us, woohoo! And then like the alcohol industry was like, please, no, keep these laws in effect, this <laughs> helps us. They liked the idea of having a, a, an extra government employee there. You know, they looked at that as like they were helping. They weren't really making a much of an impact on, you know, they weren't hurting them, they were helping them. Things mistakes didn't happen because of that. And and then they would testify before Congress that if you take away the government oversight, then you're going to start seeing people get deceived by poor labeling and advertising. Everything they said in that time in the early 80s has you know come to fruition to be right. And the one thing that they all agreed upon pretty much was the tax stamp because they would they were clunky. A lot of them would get lost in the mail. They did a study where they cost like the government like fifteen million dollars a year because the government actually printed it like they do money yeah. and issued them out, and so they had to recirculate them all the time, and it was it was very laborsome intensive, and so that was like one area where they kind of all agreed on was like all right let's get rid of the tax stamp, and um, yeah, and so I mean, they all have they, they all printed on codes on all of them and everything like that printed on codes and dates I mean there's yeah they all changed over the years as well. I mean, Reagan. Reagan basically brought a blowtorch to a lot of government procedures, and then that basically was was the death knell to it. And once the brands didn't have to have the tax stamp on there anymore, they're like, hey, that was one thing that was is never going to come back. And the only time you'll see it, where if it's fanciful, and you know, sadly, like what McKenna puts it on there. And, mm -hmm. yep. McKenna D. does. D.H. Taylor. D. H. Taylor um, you know, I think Saffle does. Uh, I think Greenbrier does. I'm just looking at Kenny's shelf, actually. Oh, yeah, you got cheat sheet. I was like, damn, you can name all these stuff. <laughs> it's one uh, way to do it. Um, yeah. but you, you have, um, it, it, it's funny to me. It was, um, Norton Simon's, uh, CEO, which is who operated Sitza Weller at the time, basically predicted all of the transgressions we have seen in labeling in like 1981 in those in those testimony periods but yeah so that's um i don't even know what what the question was it got me down that rant but is there any more bourbon hunting left <laughs> <No>. <laughs> yeah i think we were talking about yeah is there 
You all know how I am. I get all, I get no, all excited to talk we'll, about tax day. We'll like, bring it back hey. somehow. Well, <laughs> th- Fred throws it off course, and then I just add fuel to the fire yeah. by asking questions about him throwing it off course. <laughs> Kitty's like looking at a spreadsheet. Uh, yeah. Guys, no, no. <laughs> like, we have we're, this outline says topic this now at this time stamp. <laughs> yeah, you got me there. Oh, well. So I do. I, I definitely think there is bourbon hunting still in stores. Is it? Is it? Uh, Rampant, absolutely not. You gotta work. You gotta work for it, and you're gonna have to go in the seedy parts of town sometimes. Yeah, you have to go to rural, rural areas that you don't that you may not want to go into. This is the forgotten part of of bourbon hunting, and I'm about to let loose one of my secrets, and that is going into bars, uh, old bars that look like shit. You might get your ass kicked, but if you start that conversation by putting a twenty. Or, you know, on the table, like, hey, I'm just curious, you got any cases back there? They're not going to, I mean, they, those places will have nooks and crannies of uh, where they've had cases back there. You know, that, it's funny you say that. I've, I've had good luck at country clubs, you know, like old country oh, yeah. clubs where yeah. they've had bourbon and you're like, I went to Owensboro Country Club and they had a vintage 20 year on year out on the bar and they're like, yeah, we got a couple in the back too. Nobody's ever drank in 30 years, you know? And you're like, what? Wow. <laughs> and you know, that's look- happened at multiple country clubs where, you know, they, people think it's rock good or not any good. And, you know, they just, it just stays back in the liquor storage. Well, that's good. I mean, and that, that is the type of an audience that the, that the distributors and the bar owners want to get high end stuff, but they're not educated sure. about the, uh, about what's, what's in the bottle. And what a great place to hunt country clubs. Now you have to, you have to be a member to get into these places. I mean, I'm not a member of a country club, so I was a guest. So I don't, I just popped in like, so that's, that's just walk plan. in like you belong. <laughs> that's a new strategy <laughs> like, right there. It is. And they ask you for a code just, or like your member number, just say like, uh, 1458 <laughs> <laughs> Thompson Thompson. Yeah. Thompson. So I guess that that kind of brings up a, another good thing. And Fred, I'm going to go last on this cause you'll probably be both of us here, but Ryan, what's your best ever dusty score? Dusty score? Oh gosh. Uh I mean, I was just I mean, that one the country club was pretty good. I remember you telling me yeah, like, the you, vintage it, you, brought, was... you took a you, you were like, just fill up this flask. <laughs> well, the, the ironic thing is they wouldn't sell it to me. So they were like, but while so, they were like, I won't buy they won't sell you the whole entire bottle, but they'll sell you by the, they were like, it was an open bar. And they were like, Well, we'll just serve it to you by the drink. And I was like, Well, I want four shots, you know, and so they pour them up and I go out to my bag and fill my flask up <laughs> and like four more, <laughs> four more till I got my flask full. But, uh, man, gosh, dusty bottles. I mean, I, I don't know. My favorite is anything 83 to like 86. Oh, granddad. I, I just have a soft spot in my heart for those. Those are like my favorite ones. They're, they're so good. It's, You're not wrong, man. Uh, they, they are so good. I they, don't there's really never have, been a bad one. I don't have any like cool unicorn green glass Van Winkles or anything like that. I had I had one of those cool Heaven Hill um, bottles that kind of came in that decanter with the horse on it. I had one. You, you had a David Hobbs' yeah, house with yeah. us. Um, I did have one of those. That was probably my most unique or rare one. But uh, yeah, the old granddad's always anything National Distiller. Like I'm like doing cartwheels because I got them. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Fred brought up the kind of anecdote about oh i did have a chessman i did have a chessman that was oh oh, okay story that's a big one yeah i had a chessman uh the queen um but it's gone now so where's the story where's the story yeah how'd you get it i got it at an estate sale i would go you know after the whiskey pig event i started you know built i was like talking about i went to state sales and stuff i would get in carrier journal look at the classifieds and go to estate sales and i found it i think i paid like 30 bucks for it you that's know. a that's a score right there. Yeah, thirty bucks is a great score. Given I gave seven hundred for an entire set, abs- absolutely. No, no, seven thousand. I was about to I say, say that was seven thousand. No, seven seven thousand. <laughs> it was like with wait. the rug and everything. <laughs> it was like you yeah. went on that one. Yeah, I would say so. Mine is to kind of follow on what Fred had talked earlier about how every week there's somebody that finds a case of something in Grandma's basement, and. I was always like, how come like that never happens to me? Like I've never like had to go to a family's house and then they just got, oh, you know, it's Christmas time. We'll go in and see what, you know, great uncle Joe has underneath of his cabinet. And oh, what do you know? There's this whole plethora of like dusty turkey. Never happened to me. So my my grandmother-in-law, Lauren's grandma, uh, she was moving out of her house and, and moving into an assisted living facility. And 
of course, me being me, uh, going over there to like help clean out the house. What's the first thing I do? I run to the liquor cabinet <laughs> and uh, real nice. Yeah, I know. And and I was just like, oh, I'll start looking around and I start pulling around and it, she had bottles like she had gin bottles that were labeled like had painter's tape on them that said like vodka on them. Like she was like reusing. It's funny, like a ton of state sales. They always had gin, like a ton of gin bottles that mm. and vermouth. It was like, why don't y'all have some? I guess they that, drink a lot of martinis. And being martini. <laughs> it was that. And I lifted up a few bottles and some were like liqueur bottles and they were all cloudy and all this other kind of stuff. And and then I see this this uh, this kind of like purple and gold box, and it says Rebel Yell on the top. And I'm like, I start lifting up. I was like, Oh God, Oh God, it feels full. Please, please be sealed. Please be sealed. Please be sealed. I open it up. 1970s Rebel Yell Stitzel mm. Weller, and I was just like, It finally happened to me. This has never happened to me before. So I went to Grandma and I said, Grandma, like I'll give you like four or five hundred dollars for this. Like I want to offer you something fair. She was like, Oh, Kenny. I'll never drink this. Just have it. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> like, uh, yeah. Uh, before anybody else in the yeah. family said, I'm like running out to the cart, put it in there. Like, so yeah, it was, uh, it was, it was probably the, you know, free, but it was, it was also really nice because coming down from a family member. Yeah. That's awesome. So uh, for me, it's, it's not, uh, you know, full disclosure, I get retained to professionally go do this and buy things and, yeah, and give me and, some more of that old crow. That shit's yeah, good. unbelievable. <laughs> right. So, uh, so I have to, you know, uh, use some. You can go take a look at the Bardstown Bourbon Company's uh, vintage library, oh, which yeah. I curated. We, want, we should talk about that after you finish 18, your story. Eighteen, you know, I've got an eighteen ninety or uh, eighteen ninety two whiskey in there. I've got some uh, nineteen oh six stuff. Yeah, I've got the entire uh, chest of canner piece in there. But uh, I, I was the story I would give would be one that I, that I did for me personally, and I still have these bottles. And, um, I, I was, I've been on the hunt for a particular, uh, Dowling, an eight year old Dowling bottle to bond since I wrote my book, uh, Whiskey Women, because Mary Dowling played a huge part of that book. And, you know, when she moved, uh, she and her family moved their, uh, Waterfill and Fraser distillery to Mexico, effectively starting to create Mexican bourbon prior to prohibition. I mean, they would alter the course of bourbon history and are the main reasons why bourbon became a unique product to the United States is that they got, you know, the Kentucky distillers got tired of seeing this Mexican bourbon on the market. And so I've always been on the hunt for Mexican bourbon. I don't, and that was, uh, that was always very special to me. And I happened to find a bottle, uh, finally, and I, I spent probably more than I should, which is often the story when you find a bottle you want, right? You get you get overzealous about it and you get very excited and you sp you're like, you know what? I will pay that. Yeah. You know, you don't think you don't think with your your pocketbook, you think with another part of your brain. And it uh I get the bottle, so excited about it, I crack it open, I taste it, and it was one of the top five worst tasting things I'd ever oh, had in my life. No. You know. But it was made at that distillery in Mexico. It was a Mexican bourbon. I had gotten it. It was it was one of my top ones to hunt, and and then I got it. And then sometime later, I got another. I got a, a Dowling bourbon from when they made it. They put their name back on some Kentucky products, and you know that one too was a, was a hunt. It was a guy who was in the his family was in the distilling industry, and his uh, his dad grandpa was like a master distiller. But I was able to obtain a, a great deal of Dowling products and new make fresh off the still in the 1940s. So that is a true unicorn. That is, cool. that is a true it, unicorn. It, that just made, brought up a story in my head to think about. Of I probably should have told this for my cool story, but my so my dad and his property is on an old distillery lake. It used to be the original Willet Distillery there mm -hmm. in Bardstown, off Nazareth Road. Now Heaven Hill owns the warehouses, and I think Old Tubs like building their new distillery there or something now but, but anyways there was this brand called Stephen foster was in a fiddle bottle mm, yeah yeah you yeah. know and we used to find them all over the property because the lake we used to be the fed to feed the distillery i used to find them but they're all shattered or i could never find one that was full or anything but then online there was this guy that had one and you know he wanted like 500 bucks for it and i was like oh, that's a lot of money you know at the time and you know i overpaid for it but he's like well i'll give you a miniature too you know and i was like oh that's great and so i got it Gave it to my dad for Father's Day present, and 
Did he shatter yeah. it in the backyard? Like, no, <laughs> he didn't shatter it. Join the rest of them. <laughs> it's still sitting on a shelf that we we opened the little miniature to try it, and it was one of the. It was terrible. Like it just tasted like dog shit. <laughs> yeah, and that's and I, and I think that's one. of the But great it's cool lessons. that we have a full bottle that we can put on the shelves, but we know never not to drink it. Or yeah. maybe it was the, the glue dusty. that got it in there. It could be the glue because it was a miniature. <laughs> yeah, but one of the great lessons in Dusty's is like. It is a crapshoot. It is an absolute crapshoot. And I would say you hit probably, you hit on greatness 20% of the time. You hit on meteorocracy, you know, after that 20%, so 30%. So I would say half of it is drinkable. The other half, buckle up. It is not drinkable. <laughs> <laughs> but you, oh, you always have a story. And if you don't mind parting money with your story, kind of like playing <laughs> blackjack or craps or whatever, then go for it. And I will say, I will say that rye tends to keep better than bourbon. And I think that is a story for another time. Yeah, I think we'll have to because I don't think I've had a dusty rye before now that I think about it. Mm, I've had I dusty. We had the Rittenhouse rye. Oh, but is the Rittenhouse rye really a dusty bourbon? That just yeah, came pre-2000s. out. pre-2000s. Well, right yeah. I but guess it was distilled pre-2000s. 21, 23, 25 year, but. Oh, you talking about those single barrels from back in the day? Yeah. yeah. Those were amazing. I know. Those yeah. are magical. Yeah, but those were, I, they didn't spend 30 years in a glass bottle being oxidized yeah. or anything. Or if you've like had that. the green glass Van Winkle rye from yeah. the medley stuff, oh man. That's yeah the nectar all, of the gods. The Van Winkle stuff. That was when I was building that collection at Bardstown. That was that was goal one. Uh, full uh, chest of canner peat that are set. Goal two, all the Van Winkles. <laughs> <laughs> they got some special Van Winkles. Yeah, in there. and, and you know they really weren't. They really were not that hard to obtain. That was not much of a hunt. That was going to someone I knew who had them. Because it was you and Bill that curated that, right? That whole yeah. Well, I bought a lot off of Bill. Yeah, Bill. Bill was, um, you know, was very, very kind to uh, release a few. But it definitely, so the the story, my favorite story from that collection is the Chester Canner series. This, you know, this was all obtained legally, but you have to show if you're selling to someone, you have to show your license. And the person we bought it from didn't want to show her her license. And and the transaction has to take place in the facility. And, uh, you know, you can't look at a decanter. I happen to have all the weights of every one of the chess pieces before uh, uh, empty and then full. So I would weigh every one of them. Uh, I was like, listen, I'm not paying you $7,000 if they're Some of these are empty. Yeah. Yeah. I was sure. like, so I'm, we're weighing them. And she's over here like fidgeting, all nervous. And, you know, the, the majority were, were, were full. And, uh, and so she got her check, but it was a very weird experience. So, but, um, but you know, it was all legit, legal, everything, you know, real person. And the whiskey checks out and that's yeah. what matters. I had yeah. a Chesman last time I was at BBC. It tasted just like I remembered. Yeah. I, I regret, I regret ever telling anybody that that was the greatest bourbon I'd ever tasted. Yeah. You did that a long time ago. Then all of a sudden that <laughs> became one of the, the crown jewels of, of Dusty's was, yeah. was that. I, in, you know, that was, I did it on BBC. I don't know why, but this guy asking me in that, in his British accent, and yes, sir, what, tell us, what is, what is your favorite bourbon you've ever had? No one's ever been able to get that out of me. And that guy just asked me in that way, and I'm like, <laughs> oh, definitely the old crow uh, chest canopies. And what was it about that that you loved? And I just went on about the whole story, and then boom, it was on he Reddit. Fred's heart is a British accent. I know. Yeah. It gets me every time. So one last question before we kind of throw this out, because I know that in the 70s, they had, we talked about earlier, the beam decanters and everything like that. There's always been this thing of like, if you get it, decant it real quick and then drink it because people are like, oh, it's going to leach lead poison, lead poison, or... lead into it and stuff like that. Now, I've tried a bunch. I don't think I've tasted lead. I haven't gotten myself checked out. Maybe lately. that's what's wrong with us. Maybe that's what know. it is. Just, just <laughs> micro doses of lead poisoning. Is <laughs> yeah. that what it is? But well, I think from a liability perspective, I think it's very important for us to note that we are not doctors <laughs> by any means. Um, we, we did stay at a Holiday Inn last night. And yep. you should, if, if you are to get in this game, and, it makes, and you, you should have it tested for lead with the little strips that you can buy at like Lowe's or something like that. But with that said, you know, most of the ones that, that always come up, the whiskey's just not good anyway. You know, I the decanters don't really hold them well. 
And you talk to like uh, Bill Thomas. He's like, I don't buy decanters. Like decanters are the, they're they're very. Except you, the chessmen. Except the chessmen. <laughs> and, and, and again, I have the weights of all the chessmen. But that's why they are so, um, you can't trust them. It's the evaporation because you cannot see inside the bottle. And that's why today I get so pissed off at like the colored bottles. Like I, I want to be able to see what's inside the bottle. And the evaporation and all that stuff is real. The The cork never holds in good. It's not a good fitting. And, you know, if it's stored in the wrong place, boom, it's just, it's it's not going to be good whiskey. There you go. Now we're coming know. from an expert and we know it. We know it. Well, guys, this was a fun episode talking about Dusty. This is something I've been wanting to do for a long time. And the yes. fact that we got three really good Dusties to drink while we're doing it makes it Gosh, all much they better. Were good. God, that old crow was yeah, good. Yeah, old crow stands above. <laughs> I'll tell you what, I'm still a big fan of this old head. Yeah, over the here. old crow, the Heaven Hill, and then the sorry rare bird that the rare breed was. Uh, it was still good. It was though. still really good though. Yeah, I know it's still really good. Yeah, the rare breed was good, but it was a distant third for me. So, well, guys, uh, this was fun. Again, great episode on talking about Dusty's Dusty hunting aspects of why we think dusties taste different and if you want us to taste your dusties make sure you uh you reach out to us we'll uh we'll be very open yes we'll validate all dusties <laughs> oh, Fred got a kick out of this one didn't he he did he barely keep he chuckles over here <laughs> but with that i want to say uh thank you everybody for tuning in make sure you subscribe wherever you listen make sure you subscribe to fred minnick where you can get all your fred minnick news and uh yeah with that cheers everybody we'll see you all next week Vodka sucks. Toodles. <laughs>